Never before in the history of mankind were humans more aware of the threat from bioweapons. We've learned the hard way that one virus is capable of bringing the world to a standstill. One virus can kill millions and bleed the global economy. What if a country were to deliberately export such a virus? The question we are asking is this. Is the world prepared to counter the threat posed by bioweapons? Let's open up the session for deliberation. Unconventional weapons. Unconventional means. Unconventional pathogens. Unconventional pandemics. Natural, man-made, or a combination of both. Is this a wake-up call? Is the world prepared for a biological war? Session 2. The Emerging Threat from Bioweapons. And the dialogue partners for this session are Fabzia Kufi, peace negotiator, Afghanistan. Vladimir Astapenka, former minister of Belarus. Mitsuaki Kojima, former ambassador of Japan. Hello everyone, I'm Susan Tehrani. It's great to be in Dubai from New York. Thank you so much for joining us in person, Mr. Minister, Mr. Ambassador. Unfortunately, Fauzia Kofi could not be with us uh, in person or uh, virtually due to an emergency, but we have great speakers with great experience to talk about uh, this issue. And, you know, while the COVID-19 pandemic was something very novel, the threat of bioweapons really has not been for many years. And we came to really, at least in a contemporary form, uh, understand it partially after 9-11. Uh, for a lot of us after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, at least in the United States, we learned about uh, the bioweapon labs with Al-Qaeda, um, how they had those tendencies, and then we talked about non-state non actors, rogue states, uh, having the ability to acquire them on the one hand, and on the other hand, how um, easy it was for them to acquire them. Uh, and then fast forward, uh, we have something like uh, COVID uh, that is a pathogen. And uh, for a very long time, uh, we were sort of, um, it was a political taboo to talk about the origins. So talking about that was um, difficult as well. So with that in mind, um, you know, the dual use, the dual um, sort of um, aspect of bioweapon and bioterror, I'd like to just set the stage and um, ask you, Mr. Minister, why is it so important uh, to address the issue of bioweapons at this point in time? And why has it become uh, such an important talking point? Well, thank you so much. Uh... I would start maybe with joining my words of condolences to the peoples of the United Arab Emirates with the disease of national leader Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al-Nayan. 
And of course, I would uh, like to uh, thank the uh, organizers of this event, Vion, for inviting me and uh, to say how privileged I am uh, to be among the distinguished speakers and the distinguished audience here in Dubai. That's my first experience. Uh, and I feel comfortable in this chair, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, I hope that, uh, yes, uh, during this event we will be able to find the answers to the most uh, challenging questions and uh, problems uh, we are facing. Uh, I shall maybe mention at the very beginning that I represent uh, the National Anti-Crisis Management it, which, it, it is a team uh, set up by the Belarusian political leaders that were forced uh, to work in exile following the uh, falsified presidential elections back in 2020, basically exactly with the time when the COVID uh, pandemic uh, started uh, going around the world. Uh, by the way, that was one of the reasons why the people so actively reacted uh, uh, at the presidential elections, because uh, at the very beginning, uh, the president of Belarus, Lukashenko, at that moment, said he didn't believe in any viruses and he didn't believe in any quarantine measures. And the best way to cope with that is uh, sauna and vodka. And so that was the, the only answer. Uh, on the part of the authorities at that moment on the really developing pandemia and problems that the people in Belarus faced. Uh, and that was pr provoking uh, the very angry reaction of the citizens, let's say, during the elections which Lukashenko completely lost. Uh, well, since then we've been fighting, uh, we've been opposing uh, the regime, we believe a legitimate regime in Belarus, uh, for almost two years. And uh, the losses that we suffered already uh, could be compared to the casualties of the war, uh, when we say that there are about 50,000 people arrested, uh, dozens killed, tortured, uh, disappeared, and uh, this more than 1,200 political prisoners in the country, and these numbers are going up since the massive repression still go on. But uh, following the beginning of the aggression against Ukraine on the February 24th, we believe that our struggle, as well as the whole world, turned out to be in a completely different stage that makes very things very, very different from what we used to have. And uh, your colleagues already quite correctly mentioned that it's for the first time in 77 years after the end of the Second World War, we, uh, we are very close uh, to, uh, we are on the brink of the of this, uh, next World War, which, is, which could not be tolerated, which should be reacted and which should be reflected, I would say. Uh, the question is uh, whether the world has become safer or more secure after these three months of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. And I should add, unfortunately, uh, the regime of Belarus took an active part in this aggression, providing the air strikes for missile strikes for troop movements on the shortest route to Kyiv uh, from the southern part of Belarus. And of course, any reasonable man would say, uh, would give you a definite answer, definitely not. The world is not safer, the world is not uh, more secure, because already we have witnessed the problem with the atomic energy security at the Chernobyl and Zaporizhia nuclear power stations in Ukraine. Already, uh, we may say that the uh, border of Russia with NATO, and Russia was very much preoccupied about this border, is already doubled with the accession of Finland and Sweden uh, to the alliance. And here the question may arise whether the threat of using a biological weapon is higher than it used to be. And I may say yes. 
in spite of the fact that the biological weapons are forbidden by the International Convention of 1972, and all European countries are members of this convention, are parties to this convention, and they should respect all the obligations of not stockpiling, not uh, spreading, uh, and not using biological weapons. Unfortunately, um, during last months, we've been witnessing multiple times how Russia and Belarus, unfortunately, neglected uh, their international obligations, be it in the field of human rights protection, be it in the sphere of uh, sovereignty of nations and non-use of force, be it in the sphere of the non-proliferation of the nuclear weapons. Because during this war, Russia would start rhetoric of using nuclear weapons and Lukashenko supporting Russia would say that he is ready to deploy super nuclear, nuclear weapons in, in the territory of Belarus. And this situation really uh, requires the strong reaction of the international community because uh, for the moment we have social surveys saying that more than 90% of the population of Belarus are strictly against the war against, uh, with Ukraine. And they are strictly against using the forces of Belarus and the infrastructure of Belarus in this war. But uh, the legitimate leader has the freedom of uh, doing things that are not really corresponding to the wills of the people. So uh, I would say that uh, the effectiveness of democratic control the respect for democratic values would give the strong basis for the uh, ensuring uh, the predictability in the actions of the political leaders, either dictators or not. And we shall be really striving to do this uh, very effectively in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, uh, Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd love to follow up uh, on what Mr. Minister said regarding uh, the region. He touched upon a very interesting issue, and we can talk about Russia and Ukraine. But because of what's happening in Europe, the largest land war since World War II, the issue of biological weapons is front and center. Uh, Japan knows this very well. You were a victim of a terrorist biological weapon in 1995, the underground sarin attack uh, in the subway station, uh, which was, you know, a, a weapons of mass destruction, considered a weapons of mass destruction by a minority terrorist group. So we know that that's extremely possible. But then because of the low cost aspect, the deniability of bioweapons, State actors now that feel insecure, that are not superpowers like Russia, like the United States, they feel that perhaps having bioweapons that are low cost can perhaps guard them in this atmosphere of uncertainty in this world. And lo and behold, you know, despite having weapons convention rules and regulations, you can really start an arms race at the end of the day uh, with just having this atmosphere of uncertainty. Um, do you have any thoughts on that before we move on to the issue of Russia and Ukraine more? Well, thank you very much uh, for asking a uh, uh, nice question. Uh, uh, but it, it is a very difficult answer. It's a specific, uh, specialized uh, topic. Um, now, I think, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, Previous uh, speaker, including um, uh, Mr. Chaudhry, at the outset, uh, we are mindful of the danger of bioweapons. Uh, in face of the Wuhan originated uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, COVID 19, um, it spread so fast uh, in the world every corner of the world. And already in two years, uh, 483 million people infected, over 6 million people dead. And uh, well, uh, we have uh, uh, past experience 
uh, during the end of uh, uh, well, uh, towards the end of uh, World War I, uh, there was um, Spanish flu so rampant in Europe and the United States and so on. Uh, it is called Spanish flu. But it is uh, not really uh, the origin of uh, the uh, Spanish flu is not in Spain. Uh, it is uh, originated from Oklahoma, United States. During wartime, United States uh, sent troops to war front. And there, the flu spread very fast. And Spain was at that time neutral so that uh, the press and the media wasn't restrained, so that uh, the flu uh, spread in Spain, deported to Europe and to the world. And uh, Spain had a wrong name, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, during the war, uh, World War II, uh, there have been some uh, there was uh, some uh, the research, development, and in some cases, uh, production of bioweapons. And after the, the World War II, uh, uh, recognizing the danger of the bioweapons, as he said, uh, the, uh, the Convention on the Prohibition of uh, development, the production, and the stockpiling of uh, bioweapons was signed in 1972 and uh, became, became way, uh, uh, effective in 1975. So we have institutions to control uh, the bioweapons uh, in uh, every way, development, production and stock pairings. And uh, 83 me members, uh, countries are members to the convention. Uh, quite a number of uh, uh, countries are members, including uh, UN uh, permanent uh, security members, for all five are uh, members to the, to the convention. So the in international institution is there already. But here uh, there are some uh, uh, shortfalls uh, on the convention. The first shortfall is uh, the, uh, about 14 countries are non-members to the convention. There are uh, some countries, I don't want to name the uh, countries um, because I'm, I've been in diplomacy, so <laughs> Uh, for the courtesy of the, uh, all the countries, I don't name, but uh, there are countries uh, who are fighting each other. So I think the, uh, this convention is not universal yet. So we have to make efforts to make this convention universal. That's pressing. The second shortfall is verification. Uh, they uh, could not agree on verification mechanism on the convention. So that if there is a violation or s suspected uh, doubts and so on and so forth, there was no way to verify it. And on top of it, on top of it uh, the bioweapons ha have been destroyed in many countries. United States declared the destruction of uh, bioweapons in 1972 under Nixon ad administration. And Japan too, we destroyed all the bioweapons. Uh, but there is no verification there. And the second one, on top of it, uh, after the destruction of bioweapons, uh, there is a need for uh, the uh, 
bio research for security purposes. Obviously, there might be use. There might be uh, use of uh, bio weapons sometime, uh, so that uh, the militaries have to prepare for it, to defend from such use of bio weapons, uh, and also for the uh, 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 public health purposes. Such, you know, uh, uh, the bio research should be kept. And there, it is very difficult uh, to investigate. And therefore, there are many rumors uh, here and there about in Ukraine too. There is a rumor that the United States may have assisted the such a, uh, such a uh, research, bio research in Ukraine. But that is not true though. But they are um, I, uh, also the... Can I just follow? Yes. Can I just follow up on, on uh, that when you talked about the bio-research uh, labs in Ukraine? The U.S. says it's for peaceful purposes. Russia says that these bio-labs may not be for peaceful purposes. But regardless of that, just the importance of what's happening in Ukraine, between Ukraine and um, Russia, there is consensus that even if Russia does not does not have plans to attack those bioweapons labs, the fact that they might even be accident, just to pinpoint the urgency of, of, of this topic, just the fact that they might accidentally be attacked one way or the other, and electricity goes out, you pointed to Chernobyl, these pathogens, because they are, again, for dual use, and it's very difficult to identify whether they could be used for bioterror uh, purposes or, you know, for scientific research, if electricity goes out, then they could go into the community and then infect the community. Uh, you know, how difficult it is, is it to contain and how difficult is, is it to regulate? You rightly noted that there are a lot of loopholes in UN rules and regulations. But first of all, terrorists and rogue states, as you mentioned, don't abide by those rules and regulations. Uh, wars don't really abide by those rules and regulations. Countries, I mean, there was a political taboo really even regarding the lab leak theory when it came to China. We weren't even able to talk about that for a very long time. And when we talk about preventive measures, as you mentioned, I mean, one of those issues is to remove those poli uh, political taboos, those barriers, so something like COVID doesn't happen again. So I know it's a very loaded question, but I'd like to pose it to you, Mr. Minister. Um, what to do? I mean, is this a wake-up call for policymakers to first of all put these political taboos uh, aside, and second of all, because uh, Mr. Ambassador really put the leeway on the issue of these bio labs in Ukraine, whether uh, they are funded by the U.S. or not, but they are in the middle of a war zone right now. What happens to them? With your permission, I will continue. I fully share, first, the point expressed by my colleague uh, that uh, the biological weapon sphere would need international verification. Uh, we have a very uh, effective example of uh, Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons that is rather effective on controlling everything which happens in the world with the chemical weapons, but unfortunately we don't have this mechanism for biological weapons. And of course there are difficulties in differentiating between military use and uh, pharmaceutical use, for example, of these weapons. And I fully agree with you that, uh, re yes, the world was on the brink of uh, losing one, one of the agents of, uh, of the, of, that were used for the laboratories, because definitely they have their own protocols and they have their own security, which is good and working in the peaceful times. When you have indiscriminate bombing of the city where there is a bio lab, uh, there is a real danger of uh, losing this stamp, uh, losing this agent, and uh, there is a real danger of biological threat. 
Uh, as for the uh, information from both sides, I read different reports from the Russian side, from the Ukrainian side. As it always happens during the war, each side has its own truth. Uh, Russian is accusing the Ukrainian side of producing bio weapons. Ukrainian side is explaining that this is the program legally established with the U.S. authorities on the basis of the international agreements and on the basis of uh, general investigation of the, of the things. And, I mean, we should be ready for that. But uh, are we safer uh, hearing two sides of the stories? Not really. And the answer to this question is that we should really eliminate the war as the main source of this danger that could bring the biological weapons into our world. Uh, we have enough uh, other uh, challenges, let's say, to face. And... Uh, well, uh, maybe one more reference, because we, I know that uh, during these last three months, uh, Russian propaganda, supported by Belarusian propaganda, uh, used very many fake stories on everything, basically, starting from we are not the aggressors, we are the victims, and uh, I would call it very Hitler-style Lukashenko phrase, if we should not have initiated this military operation, we would have been attacked by the Ukrainian forces. As simple as that. So, uh, bearing in mind the Russian uh, track already on Novichok uh, affairs in the UK, in Bulgaria, uh, with Alexei Navalny, I would not be surprised to hear uh, one more, more accusations from the Russian side uh, directed to Ukraine, but I still believe that uh, Ukraine is strict on uh, performing its international obligations on biological safety. Mm. Right, and uh, I'd like to wrap up by asking both of you uh, whether or not, you know, there is this conversation that we have in the United States that perhaps we had test runs for pathogens and uh, bio attacks and those test runs uh, around the world for the most part maybe the swine flu maybe the bird flu and then you know a shock like COVID came and hit the world um, is the world do you think prepared now for another biological style attack should it happen and do you think China bared the responsibility that it should for what it did to the world, ultimately. I mean, there was a window of opportunity where all of this could have been controlled had China informed the world on time. It really didn't at the end of the day. And that's, you know, it's, it's a fact. We know that now. So one of the aspects and one of the things that we talk about during this conference is preventive policies, that we learn from our mistakes and are we ready for what's to come? Here. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a very relevant question, Susan. And uh, if uh, the bioweapons are in the hand of the international ter terrorist uh, sect, it's awful. Uh, we should prevent it. And that question lead to my uh, third short hold uh, of the Convention on the Prohibition of uh, Development uh, uh, Production Stockpiles of Bioweapons. That is lack of international judiciary system. Uh, that means you know, those who violate the convention should be investigated and also tried for justice at a certain international organ. There is an uh, International criminal, just, cr criminal Court of Justice based in The Hague, Netherlands. But here again, some shortfall of the international judiciary system. Only 122 countries are members. And for respectable reasons, United States and Russia opted out. So that those non-members of the convention are not be subject to investigation, subject to justice, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think it is very, very imperative for us to reinforce 
international judicial system um, uh, to try those committed violations uh, in due course. Uh, we shouldn't um, punish people by rumors. We should avoid that. Uh, it should be brought to justice, uh, to the established international organ. Otherwise, you know, it is difficult to dissuade those who might uh, uh, the uh, use the uh, bio weapons. And another thing, thing is the uh, Interpol, uh, international uh, um, ICPO, Interpol. Right. They are subject. Well, they are responsible to investigate those who violate, those who may have violated. Uh, the convention and uh, uh, the uh, use or the uh, development and the production of the bio, bio, bio substances, the bio weapons, and so on and so forth. When the stakes are high, basically, then perhaps that accountability might come into play. Yeah, that's yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Minister, your concluding maybe, remarks. Maybe a few words. Uh, well, I fully agree that we need to think of more effective mechanisms for the accountability of those who violate the international norms. It comes to the aggression, or it comes to the human rights violations, or it comes to biological weapons. But I mean, the more efficient the system would be, uh, the, and the accountability should be finally inevitable. And that would help to prevent uh, this threat. As for the world, I believe we've spent uh, at least one year in a very restricted conditions with the masks, all kinds of uh, social distancing, and uh, maybe we are really better prepared for another challenge. But I hope that uh, the people all the world would, would, would find the common ground for uh, controlling this from the very beginning, of sharing the information, finding the effective ways to, to solve it, and we are living in one, one world, and we should be really guided by, by this uh, noble idea to ensure peace in our, in our planet. Thank you. Mission Peace, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, and thank you.